Hear these words from the Scriptures, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things and through whom also He made the universe. This is God's Word for God's people. Thanks be to God. So when, when was the last time um, that you were in the room that something was happening that got your attention? It's different because we do a lot of this on, um, on our phones now. Like, I love music. I love live music. And I will spend, ask my family, more time than I, than I probably should um, listening to people talk about music and, and play music and um, kind of dive into things about it on, on my phone. You know what I don't do a lot of? Is just being where someone is actually playing it. And there's something that changes about being in the same space and time that something is actually happening. Uh, any, any sports fans here today? Pulling for Kansas City today? Yeah, yeah, um, so am I. G- gonna be a tough game, I'm, I'm betting, but I'm, I'm excited. And I'm gonna watch these like professional sports players uh, play football somewhere else. And that's, it's, I'm planning on having a good time. Last night, or last yesterday afternoon, I watched a bunch of 11-year-olds play basketball. And it was kind of intense, guys. There's something about being in the, in the space that changes things. And, and we are so used to having our reality mediated for us. And then we miss like the, the things that make it human or real. Like when I'm watching highlight reels of people playing impossible things on guitar, it's so great. But that's not like real. And when you're with somebody, even with the mistakes, somehow that kind of like brings it into reality. You know, was you all say thank you to Hannah? Um, I offered to play and no one took me up on it. Zero. Um, and look, there, there's just increasingly, we are experiencing things that are not where we are and that are not when we are. And I love technology. Like, I, I don't think it's going away. I don't think it should. I think it's incredibly valuable. This is a little dangerous. And I need some hot tea. My throat's a little mad at me. Um, but when we talk about uh, the world of technology as it kind of speeds things up and crowds space out, we kind of have to figure out, is this the right relationship that we're supposed to have with it? You know, often it's not just that we live seeing other people's highlight reels, you know, and things like, like music or food. I love to cook. Does anybody else here love to watch, um, like, cooking shows or cooking videos? You know what's weird about that? I don't get to eat it. <laughs> I watch somebody else make something awesome, and that's the end. You know, and then I have to go into my kitchen and like try, you know, like whether it's sports, whether it's relationships, we watch people have relationships on, on a show. We watch people compete for something and, and use their bodies, ironically, while we're not using ours. We watch people experience pain and talk about things that we should be upset about or scared about or offended over. And we absorb those, those fears and anxieties and offenses for ourselves, even though they're not happening where we are or to anyone we will ever meet. And being aware of like the news is important and good, I think, in some ways. But are we meant to carry a world of highlight reels in other places and other times and other spaces? Technology is a gift. Uh, and I know in, like in our world, we tend to only talk about that in terms of like electronics, but, but technology 
is, is anything that maximizes um, efficiency. And think about like the bicycle, that's, that, was tech, that was groundbreaking technology one day. You know, the, there's being able to make a hammer, that was groundbreaking technology one day. And so these experiences that we're having in our world are, yes, extreme and speeding up, but they're not in their essence, they're not new. The things that take us out of where we are and when we are. And there's a, a story in, um, in the Bible. It's one of our opening stories, really. It's in Genesis 11. And this is one of the first stories that Scripture gives us, and it's about humanity's relationship with technology. Isn't that strange? And it, it, maybe, you've, maybe you're a little bit familiar with it. Um, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we will make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. So there's this moment in human history when someone is busy making a house out of rocks and goes, there has got to be an easier way to do this, right? And says to his friends, hey guys, what if we did something easier than rocks? And they were like, wow, you are thinking big, aren't you? Just blowing the doors off of this thing with your creativity. And come around and figure out a way to do... I mean, can you imagine the revolution it was whenever the first person came up with bricks? They're uniform. They're small. You can take them with you places. They're flat. You can build them on top of each other. And then, like, the whole world opens up. You're not just talking about making, like, a shed big enough for you and, and your family maybe to huddle up in and sleep. You're talking about building uh, homes, palaces... You know, think, think about the, when the pyramids came around. Like how, the, the like light years jump that that was from finding rocks that you dug out of a field to bricks. And the world just, I mean, like took off. They get really excited. And someone's like, let's build a tower all the way to heaven. It's maybe the same guy that thought up the whole brick thing. You know, like wild thinker. And it's interesting that this story about technology, and we don't know, like, is this a single event? Is this like a whole era in human history that Scripture is summing up for us? I think that might be an interesting conversation, but not necessary for today. Of, like, how does humanity interact with these things? Because it changed the world. And something odd happens in this, in this passage when, when this potential, this really wonderful thing happens. They're like, what can we do? Creativity, possibilities, exploding. Somewhere in there it says, come, let us build a, ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. It's interesting that, that somewhere in there, Scripture has this, I mean, uh, technology, different than Scripture, um, has this way of wanting us to pull past our own limits. But wanting us to, to pull past the things that, that are helpful for ourselves and healthy for ourselves. Does anybody else here have a hard time knowing how to put technology in its place? Does anybody else here notice that maybe they're spending way more time than they planned on, on the, just staring at a, at a screen? Guys, I Google the most random things ever. Like, who was the bass player for the Doobie Brothers on their second album? Why do I need to know that? No one in my car cares. <laughs> right? You know, and that's, it's fine and fun and, and great, but, but there's, this, there's, there's this thing that happens with technology that somehow kind of makes our lives about us and, and ourselves and what we want and how can we do something Great. And uh, in, in this story, again, at the beginning of Scripture, there's, there's a lot of humor in it. There's a lot of wordplay. Um, humor has a hard time coming through other languages. Uh, and it, it's, it's quite interesting. So they're working on, they're like, build a tower to heaven, tall, 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 tall. And here, picking back up in verse 4, they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens as high as we can go. 
so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. And this is a bit of a joke. And the Lord came down to see the city. They're like, we're going to make this thing that's amazing. And God's like, that's so cute. You guys are trying so hard down there. Just going to come on down and see what you're up to. And he gets down there and he's like, big tower, huh? They're like, yeah, big tower. And it's interesting because he's not concerned about the tower. That's not the problem. What seems to be concerning to him is what's happening inside the human heart. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they begin to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language language so that they will not understand each other. The Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. There's a few interesting things going on there. One is like, was God just being petty? Was he just being petty? Was he like, I don't want you to be able to do your thing? The first command given to humanity was to fill the earth and care for it. To fill the earth and care for it. That was their mission. They were supposed to care for and steward and fill creation. And because they have gotten excited about themselves and what technology can do for them, they have set aside the mission that God had for them in their lives to focus on the projects that they wanted for their own lives. Because the Bible has nothing to do with today. Oh, wait. Did you know that God has a mission for you and for your life and for our church? And do you ever find yourself, maybe because of the world that's just easier and more available to us than ever, that we end up focusing on just the things that are about me and my project and the things that I'm interested in? And and what if God is like, man, that is just not, not what I had for your life. I had something that was maybe more challenging but more beautiful for you than just you focusing on the project to build yourself. Let us make a name for ourselves. And so the Lord does something interesting. He scatters them, which is, which is an interesting word, by the way. Um, this was, th- just, just so I can gain some sympathy here, I, I was starting to work on this sermon um, a- about setting aside technology. And so what did I did? I fired up my MacBook and I opened up my Bible software and my note-taking app, and I put in my wireless earbuds, noise canceling, with the uh, you know with with the the music that I wanted. And then I had this moment of like, this feels a little ironic. So I I wrote this whole sermon by hand, and so now I have a greater appreciation for my elders who used to not be able just to type in good sermons about technology. I don't do that ever. And, um, <laughs> right? It's just harder. It's harder to set it aside, you know, using things like pen and ink. Um, and uh, anyway, um, scattered, right? That's where we were. I'm a little scattered. Um, so it, notice there's this, there's this repetition of this word. It, it says, uh, let's build a tower that reaches to heaven so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That was the whole thing. They were like, we don't want to be scattered. We want to be in control. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth. Or in verse 9, because there the Lord confused their language of the whole earth, from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Um, I was a communication major at Florida State in undergrad, and um, a lot of that had to do with technology. And you can't talk about technology in the modern world, studying it, without bringing up a fellow named Marshall McLuhan, incredibly interesting technological theorist. You should look him up, no joke. Um, and this is all ironic, because how are you going to do that? You're going to use Google, right? And, um, but Marshall McLuhan, one of the things he said about technology, it's just a law that's baked into it is that every time technology is overextended, it has the exact opposite effect that the user intended. 
Every time technology is overextended, it has the exact opposite effect that the user intended. I want to listen to music and I put on my headphones, I turn it up too loud and I damage my hearing. Right? I want to be healthy by taking some medicine. If I use that in bounds, it's helpful. If I take it too much or the wrong stuff, I actually make myself less healthy. And all technology is like this. I want to get places faster, so I buy a car. But then because I have a car, I fill my schedule and I spend all my time running from one place to another and I can't actually be anywhere. It's interesting to me that in the first little bit of the Bible, here's this, there's this plan that they want X. And so they use technology to give them X. They overextend the use of that technology and it gets them the exact opposite result that they were hoping for. What is it that you want technology to do for you? Lots of good things. Is it getting you the thing that you're hoping? Or are you able to put the appropriate boundaries and limits on it so that you can experience the benefit without finding something that ends up actually wounding yourself? Limits, by the way, are not humanity's strong suit. We're just not awesome at it. And if we want to find, if we want to find life, we have to figure out how to tell things in our life, where to sit, where to stay, maybe even how to roll over and play dead. Right? One time God comes down and loves his people by getting them back on mission, by scattering and confusing. Because they were trying to build up, 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 up. This other time when humanity is feeling down and crushed and downtrodden and can't find their way out, God comes down and has a very different strategy. In uh, Hebrews, my favorite book in the Bible, favorite book, there's this opening that this, this unknown preacher has. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The the author of Hebrews has this like grand vision of God and and of Jesus specifically, that, that he created all things by his word. He sustains all things by his word. The universe is his. And when God needed to save us, he came to us in person by his son. I think it's interesting that, that God did, it wasn't enough for God to send a letter. It wasn't enough for God to be here virtually. It wasn't enough for God to send us a message through a screen. God wanted to come and look his people in the eyes. He wanted to be there. And to do that, he had to choose limits. Do you know anybody that chooses limits for their life? That says no to more? I was talking to a small business owner in town a little while back. And I'm really great business. I really love it. And, and it's kind of, you know, it has this small little quaint thing. And I said, so what's next? And they said, oh, this is it. And I thought, that's weird. Isn't that against like the whole thing of like, we do more, you know? Like if this is going well, you do more. You open another shop, right? In Jackson and figure it out. And but no. And it caught me off guard. And God choosing limits, choosing to to come down in flesh and blood. What would it be like for you to choose good limits for your life? Maybe even especially around technology. What would good and helpful limits look like? Um, A while back in our family, we haven't done this in a while, uh, but what we would say is often on Wednesday nights, we called it tech-free night. And this was was helpful, uh, is after dinner, we just wouldn't, wouldn't use technology. 
um, we wouldn't use electricity. We would use the air conditioning. Air conditioning stayed. Um, but no screens, um, no lights, you know. Um, we'd use uh, candles, and um, we have a, an oil lamp, a oil lantern, nothing makes you feel like you're living in the 21st century, like walking around your house with an oil lamp, you know. I need one of those hats that, like, from A Christmas Carol. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't describe that very well. It was, it was not the best joke. You know what I'm talking about with the little... Anyway, okay. Um, <laughs> Here's the, what would it look like? And what we found out is our kids, our kids loved it. Our kids would ask for it. They would ask, our children would ask for no technology. <laughs> Who knew? It was board games and books and going to bed early and going on walks. And when the sun went down, biologically, my body would go, I guess it's time to fall asleep. And then I would wake up and I felt rested. It's unreal. Like, what would, it, what would it look like maybe for us to, to name limits to put on our lives? Because, because maybe God has something for us. Maybe it might even result with more time with the Lord. It might result in more time in his word or, or in prayer or thinking about something, reflecting on the day and getting to offer that moment to God. It might actually result in us getting back on mission a little bit in our lives. You know, I just, just wonder, what would it be like if the people of God were so countercultural that they, that they accepted limits? for the sake of love of God and neighbor and ourselves. Another thing is God chose a body. That's that's an odd thing. God chose a body. Is anybody less than like five-star review satisfied with their body? You know, how it looks or how it works. You know, and and like my, my throat's a little scratchy today and God opted in for that. God opted in for zits and B.O., he did, right? I mean, like, he, he, and like he, his mom ran her fingers through his hair. His, his disciples knew what it was like to listen to him snore. Like, when God opted in for a body, he opted in for all of it. And often we're trying to get out of our bodies. We're trying to figure out how to, how to fight to stay as young as possible or to look as different as possible or, or how to let technology do the work for us. And, and here's the thing. Like I said, I'm gonna, uh, later today, I'm going to watch a football game of like people in peak physical condition doing their thing for hours and I'm going to eat nachos. Right, like, well, how can I, how can I love my body? This home base that God has given me, that was His idea, and accept the limits that come with it. The technology, if I'm not careful, just kind of like pulls me out of it. And here's the other thing that God chose is when He, when He came. I know this, this may be like a little easy to pass over. He was present with people. He chose to be together with people. He washed their feet. They ate meals. They went on walks. He took a nap in a boat. They went fishing. When God was in heaven, he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go fishing with a bunch of dudes. And this was a part of like his plan for salvation. We are together. I mean, what would it look like for you, these three things, to choose limits? What would it look like for you to not just to choose limits, but to love thy body? There's a good book by that name, by the way. Good book. Third, what would it look like for you to be together with people? We've learned this here at the church. We used to do more things around discipleship that were, you know, like you'd come and sit and learn, you know, a lot of rows. And we noticed that that, that was preventing some piece of maturity in our discipleship. And so almost exclusively, we've really turned to like, how do we put people at tables? How do we help people see each other? Um, Divorce care and grief share are starting up soon. You may know some good people, some people that would benefit from that. Why is that not in rows where people hear information? But it's that people experience healing by seeing each other by being with each, by talking with, with one another. And there's, there's healing there. Uh, alpha, emotionally healthy spirituality and relationships, uh, rooted discipleship bands. All of these things that we found that help move our folks forward in discipleship, it's all about being together. 
How, how is it that you can find some limits to put on your life? Uh, Walt Whitman has a, a quote. He says, we were together. I forget the rest. And that it's actually a paraphrase of a longer poem where he's walking through a city and getting pummeled by advertising, things that, that companies want him to remember so that they can take his money. And as he's in this city, he falls in love. And the only thing that he remembers about the city was being with this person he fell in love with. He said, we were together and all the rest is forgotten by me. Who gets to say that about you? We were together. I forget the rest. I think there's something at the heart of God in that quote. I've just loved it. Like, is, is, that, is that heaven? Is that heaven? Is that, that the Lord saying, we will be together. The rest we'll figure out. I mean, you know, like, I just want to be with you. And uh, practices for you to, like, set aside the tech and be close. For me, one of them is, is my journal. Like, I take time to write out physical letters, you know, with my hand. And this is the main way that I take time to pray is setting aside a time to be in his word and to write out what I'm thinking um, uh, and praying. Our blessed journals that we passed out a few weeks ago. No, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about um, offering Jesus to people that aren't following him right now. Right? The first one is begin with prayer. The other ones, listen, eat, serve, and share your story. Those are all about being with people. Those are all about being present to people. And, and I, just, I just tuck this back here. I've got a few names and a few prayers and a few things that are kind of growing in my heart with how I can share Christ with others. What, what practice might be good for you to adopt to set some limits, to love your body because it's, it's what you offer to others and then to be together, you know, on the being together front, the word analog is an odd one um, because I don't think I use it quite the way it's intended. Analog literally um, comes from analogy. It's an analogy. Like if I, can't, if I can't be in the room with Tom Petty, I can listen to the record, the analog of him, you know, and, uh, which is too bad. He passed away. That's, that's sad. I mean, like, is there a better song than Free Fallen? You know, no. And, and since I can't be with him in the room, I get the analogy. I get the analog. Of, I pull out my vinyl record and I put it on the thing and it spins around. And that's analog. That's great. You know, but, uh, but he, here's the thing. Um, God put his analog in the world. His analogy in the world. It, 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 uh, one of our first stories of creation. He says, let us make mankind in our image. Image. You are the analog of God in the world. You are. You are the analogy of God in the world. When he wanted the world to experience his presence, he made you. He made you and he made the person you're sitting next to and the person you live across from and your dorm uh, mate from freshman year at school that you're really glad doesn't text you anymore. Right. He made all those people for the purpose of people experiencing him through one another. That is his analog, his analogy of himself in the world. And if we are going to get back on mission in the world that God has called us to, to, to bring the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth, it is going to be learning to see him in each other and offering him to each other from ourselves. And I think that one of the ways that that's going to happen is when we set aside the things that pull our attention out of the space that we're in so that we can look people in the eye. We can be present to them and we can offer them ourselves fully. This isn't just about self-care. That's important. This is about offering Christ to a world in need. What would be a practice that you could use to set aside the technology and be a little more, a little more analog um, as we've been going through the series, The Speed of God, we've talked about four uh, different practices. Um, is there one today that might be important for you to kind of take on and name? Maybe with your, your roommates that you live with or your family or whoever it is, your group of friends that get dinner on Saturdays. Is there some, t is there some practice that you could adopt together? Like we talked about walking the first week. That when God showed up, he showed up to walk. 
He walked in the garden. When Jesus said, follow me, he lived, they started walking. No one ever talks about running with Jesus. Right? It's, it's, it's about walking with Jesus. Maybe, maybe there's a practice of, of taking time to pray while you walk. Taking time to, to maybe to listen to worship music. Maybe it's time to clear your head. Maybe it's time to set technology totally aside. We can combo up here. But walking. Second, silence. Taking dedicated time, setting aside time to withdraw from the noise of the world and being still before God. Uh, third, Sabbath. I, I know different people have different levels of control over their own schedule, but whether it's a day or whether it's a regular couple of hours or whatever, when, if you set aside time for three things, for rest, worship, and delight. Rest, worship, and delight. How can that be a part of your life? Incredibly powerful to practice with others. And then last, analog. To set aside the digital, to set aside the tech, and to be present with one another. To take care of the bodies that God has given us. To accept limits. Which one of those might be your one to start today? In a new way. We're talking about the speed of God, that God moves slower than we do. And there's this word that came to mind, maybe because I used to watch some British television shows. It's the word Godspeed, which I feel like is impossible to say without a British accent. Godspeed. <laughs> which means like, I hope you get there real fast. But God walks slow. He usually moves slow. I have this great little book in my office called Swift Lord, You Are Not. <laughs> Isn't that great? God's not that fast. He's just not, he's just not moving too quick. He tends to slow us down when he shows up and walk with us slowly. And so what if the whole God speed thing is maybe a little wrong? What if we got to offer that to each other as a way to remind one another to slow down a bit? When you're racing out for work and you're anxious about what's ahead or you're headed to school or you're having trouble keeping up with stuff at the house or, or maybe your pace is just a little quick, what if the word we could offer to one, each other, to one another is, is Godspeed? Godspeed. What if we go a little slower? Godspeed. I, I think it might be a sweet thing to be able to offer a world in need. A world that's running faster than they should. A world that is not accepting limits and, and not on mission either. And if we could offer one another a different pace of life at God's speed, maybe just like walking at three miles an hour, it might put us back on mission to be with the God who wants to be with us. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us. Help us to normalize boredom. <laughs> Help us to normalize going slow to accepting limits. To being present in our bodies. To being with each other. Jesus, we, we want to see the mission that you've called us to. So help us to enjoy technology, but to keep it in its right place so that we can say yes to what you have for our lives. Amen. We're so glad you tuned in today. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with anyone you think could benefit. We're excited about all the content we have coming up and can't wait for you to see it. Be sure to subscribe so you won't miss out. If you're curious about LaCroix or if you're looking to take the next step on your journey with Jesus, check out lacroixchurch.org. We hope to see you again soon.